like to uh, call the uh, Sunderland School Committee meeting to order uh, Tuesday, September 21st at uh, 5.33 p.m. All right, and first item, we'll take a motion to uh, review and approve the minutes of June 7th at a special meeting on August 18th. So moved. Second. Awesome. Excellent. All right, any discussion? All right, All in, let's see, uh, Peter? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Megan? Yes. Greg, yes. Okay, minutes approved. Uh, on to the uh, financial statements and warrants. Shelly. Hi, everyone. Good to see you again. So I emailed out the expense reports. Uh, through, <laughs> sorry. Through uh, August 31st, so I'm happy to take questions about those. I thought we would talk about uh, the closeout of FY21 first. Um, so in June and July, or I'm sorry, July and August, 22 warrants were signed by school committee totaling $181,999.17. That was for warrants to finish out fiscal year 21 and for 22. So there was a combination of things in there. Um, the general fund has been closed out with the town. And actually, since writing this report, um, I did not update this today, but we are fully reconciled with all of our revolving funds. So that's great news. Um, there has been a little bit of a delay in years past because the accountant only works one day a week. We've got a new accountant in the town office and he's doing a great job as far as I'm concerned because it's uh, September 21st and we're reconciled for the year. I'm still looking over some grant things, but you know, primarily those revolving funds are a priority to make sure that we balance out the way that all the transactions are done. So that's great news. Um, so we close out the year with $170,999.96 remaining in the general fund budget. Um, if you recall, we had sort of froze the budget. You know, Ben had some flexibility if things needed to be purchased or if we needed to talk about spending some funds. Um, but we did have more than we expected. We had wanted to have 90000 90, for this year's budget um, in support of that and ended up with you know, quite a bit more. So uh, that savings was not only due to the budget freeze, but also because we had savings in transportation costs last year and then other expenses that would normally be fully expended, such as substitute coverage or PD, um, those weren't fully spent down. So, you know, that generated some natural savings just because of the way that the year was. Uh, so we reclassified school choice expenses. So basically, our school choice expenses went down by that exact dollar amount. So it brings up our bottom line, which is great news. I think we're in a really good position when we get into talking about 22. Um, any questions about any of that before I continue? Um, so I will take expense report questions if you have them. Right now, things are you know, what I would call pretty boring as far as the expense reports go. There's, you know, not a whole lot going on. I think there's um, very few accounts that are overdrawn at this point, but it's super early in the year. And, and remember, you're only getting through August 31st. You're not even getting into September. So the next month report will look much different. Uh, but we do have something new to discuss. This was written in my report. So our special education uh, out of district placement costs are increasing. Um, and Peter, you had sent an email about this, so thank you. I do always appreciate that dialogue so that it can make our conversation uh, more efficient here and then get to the nitty gritty of things. So in my report, I had talked about several pieces. So we already had the out of district placement that we were paying from school choice. That tuition was estimated at 80,000. That's coming in just shy of 87,000. So we will be over that budget line. Thankfully, we do have the school choice funds to pay for that difference. Um, you know, a lot of times when we do the budget, we don't know what the tuition at that school for the next year is going to be. So this is one of those um, natural things that comes up. Um, we also have a new out of district placement uh, that is for a school choice student. So this was is an existing school choice student that we were already receiving some special education increment funds from. So that was helping bring our total revenue for school choice up. Uh, this child, Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe is, has already been placed out of district into the new placement. And so this one is a 
you know, a done situation. The good news is, is that it will increase our SPED income increment claim and we will get dollar for dollar reimbursement on that. Um, so while we're already seeing some of that money, it is going to increase the revenue we get. The expense going out is also going to be higher, but there should be um, zero impact to uh, definitely not to the general fund and then school choice, you know, depending on what the end of year revenue ends up being, um, you know, we might see a little bit of a hit because like I said, we've already been getting part of that money in and counting on part of that money. So um, I know that's a little bit complicated to explain. If you want me to get into the, that further, I definitely will. Um, and then the last piece, this is something that is pending, but is my understanding from Karen Ferrandino, our special education director, that this is in the works, is that we have a student coming into district from another district that we do receive tuition from the other school. And it's currently uh, assessment is in process as to whether or not that student is going to remain in the district or if he's going to be placed out. Um, ben, if I have that wrong, please let me know. Um, I think the family is just trying to find the right placement for him at this point. Um, right now, what's we're looking at overall programming. So uh, there, the student being placed potentially outside of the district is is not being looked at right now. Okay, great. Um, so th with this, it's really just more of an FYI for you all. Um, you know, it doesn't have a negative budget impact for us other than we're not bringing in tuition revenue. Um, but that also means if you looked at the projection down in my report, there's also no expenses associated with it because we re we move those things around. I believe that there was a staff member in IA that we may have already reduced, um, anticipating that that change was coming. Um, so, and, and that was, you know, we didn't have to, um, actually, we might have had to eliminate one of your IAs, right? Some A new hire, I think, Ben. Um, <clears throat> yeah. The, it, it worked out so the IA had another position out elsewhere, um, yes. but so the wasn't, that person wasn't eliminated, if you will. Yeah, yeah they moved to another school within the district, so um, we were able to move them to another school. Um, so that cost there that was associated with that IA that was essentially one-to-one -one with that student is no longer in the budget. So the expense is zero, the revenue is zero. So the negative point is just that we don't have that tuition coming in in the future right now. Um, and that revolving fund has a limited balance available in it. Uh, so I just wanted to make you aware of those two points. You know, I don't I don't think it's anything that's hugely budget impacting um, the existing school choice student that we did know about that the budget is a little bit over that should that's just for this one year. So next year, that expense will go down. Uh, so we'll see that, you know, not less of an, an expense in our school choice line. Um, and then we'll have to talk about what ends up happening with that additional um, school choice student next year when things come around. Peter? Um, for either of the two uh, uh, outplacements, uh, are there any transportation costs that we're responsible for? Not that I'm aware of right now. Um, Karen has not mentioned that. Her and I have talked several times about the um, SPED transportation and she hasn't mentioned. I think one student is being driven by a parent that we may be reimbursing, which I think was also the case last year, which they just get the um, government reimbursement for mileage, that rate, which I think is 55 cents per mile um, this year or somewhere around there. Um, so it's a minimal cost. And then the other, the school choice, even if we did have to transport, I believe we would be able to get dollar for dollar reimbursement on that as well. Um, and then you had asked about circuit breaker. Um, so for the first student who is a Sunderland resident, that one, we would be able to hit that circuit breaker reimbursement if we're over a certain dollar amount, which we should be with, you know, 87,000. I think we got to be about 45. And then it's about 70 to 75% reimbursement from there. So, you know, we will have some money coming back to us for future use on that. Any other questions? Did I miss anything, Peter, that you had asked about? Thank you. Okay. Um, so just a couple of other points to make you aware of things going on in the business office. So we're currently trying to set up payroll in the school's database. 
Um, currently, payroll for the elementary schools for all four elementaries is done in Excel, and then we send that data off to the town. Um, we pay for the module for payroll because Frontier uses the payroll module in Infinite Vision. So I'm looking to get all of our schools set up in the database so that we can have more real-time data. If you look at these reports for any teacher or IA line, granted this is only through 831, so there's technically not a pay on here. Um, but if we had it set up on payroll, it would auto-calculate and populate and encumber the amount of the IA or the teacher's salary for the full year. Whereas right now, there's no expenses in here for teachers or IAs because we book them by payroll as a lump journal entry. And what I would like to do is see each individual line and each individual employee showing up in our database. Then we can generate reports from the database to send to the town just to try to increase efficiency. So that's one thing, my goal for this year, we started talking about it and working with um, the tech team with Infinite Visions last year, and hopefully we'll get that up and running. Um, and then for school lunch, uh, that has previously not been recorded in the database either. Uh, the town books things, and we had been booking from the school lunch office in Excel, and then we cross-reference and reconcile. Again, it gives us more real-time data to have all that information online and in the database. So that is happening definitely. We've already started that process. Um, so that's going smoothly as we transition, and then we'll keep working on payroll and hopefully can get that set up. Peter? I was just wondering, you mentioned uh, earlier uh, uh, complimentary things about the Newtown uh, accountant and uh, being able to have the books closed uh, by here we are in September. Um, I was wondering, like last year, was it significantly later? Um, so I don't know what they have closed on their end yet. They may still have their books open, as, but as far as the school goes, we're fully reconciled. So last year, we actually weren't able to reconcile our books because the prior, I don't hate to talk negatively about somebody who worked for the town, but the prior town accountant missed a lot of entries that we had made on our end. And this is sort of the Diff one of the difficult things about the way that our district is set up is that it's really the town's financials. And so we book things on our end and they book things on their end. And when they don't match, obviously, you have to find those discrepancies. Um, and the past two years, it's been really difficult for the school to reconcile our books with the town. So I'm really pleased with how quickly things have gone this year and that all of those entries that were problematic from the prior two years have been cleaned up and numbers match like to a penny. So well, that, I just, I, the reason I, I asked was that obviously the town itself has had a terrible time trying to close its books uh, over the last couple of years. And so the fact that, that you've been real successful in getting everything straightened out with the new accountant, you know, leads one to believe that maybe the town will have the same sort of, um, much smoother process now going forward, which means when we come to budget time, we'll already know a bunch of the information that the past couple of years we just have been guessing at. So um, that's just nice to know. So thank you. Yeah, my impression is that this um, new FERCOG accountant is really doing a great job and on top of things. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I'm not going to go over each of the revolving fund accounts. I will take questions. What I will say is that, you know, I, I feel like we're in a good financial position at this point compared to where we thought we might be. Um, we do have help coming in in a variety of sources, whether it's from revolving funds or primarily the ESSER grant in Sunderland. Um, most of that ESSER 2 funding went to support early childhood and school lunch. So that is why our projections for FY22 and those accounts look very positive. And again, that was our intention so that we could build up those revolving funds with the idea that in fiscal year 23, those funds can fully support themselves again. Um, and early childhood is back up and running with students. So we do have a good amount of revenue coming in for that program as we had prior to COVID. Um, same thing with school lunch. School lunch and breakfast also actually continues to be free. USDA extended that through this entire school year. Um, the rates are actually higher than they were last year and then they would be if we had um, cash students paying for lunch. So I feel like we're in good shape with those accounts, which is nice to see. And I think we're going to be in a positive position going into fiscal year 23. 
Um, I think one of the accounts that we probably want to talk and, and look at more closely in the future, if not at this meeting, is the school choice. Um, Peter posed a question regarding the over expending the revenue coming in. You know, we're bringing in this year about 375, which does not include that SPED increment that will go up. Um, you know, I expect it'll be at least 400,000. Um, so we are overspending and we did know that. And we have talked about trying to dial that back and having a long-term plan with school choice. With that said, if we're going into next year with 294,000, you know, we've got almost one full year in arrear. So I think we can start to really talk about a healthy financial plan of moving some f uh, expenses off of choice and onto budget. And don't forget, some of those things are naturally going to go away when that school choice or school um, out of district placement student leaves ages out next year and goes into seventh grade, that's $87,000 right there that's automatically coming off. Um, so we can look at the other pieces and definitely talk more about that. This is one thing that I think you all know is on my mind and it's on the town's mind and all of your mind that we want to find a healthy balance and make sure we're not overexpending. I think the other thing that we have to think about this year as we start talking about budgets is, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend at least, you know, I know we're only in September, but it would not be a recommendation that the school has to freeze their budget again. You know, I, I think that we did great in 20 closing out and in 21, we had a lot of extra grant money, but I think the budget is there and it's approved and clearly the school needs those funds to meet all of the needs of the students and the faculty and staff and and Ben needs to be able to go ahead and spend that money as we planned. So, you know, I think we'd have to be talking about FY23 if the increase was in a really bad shape, um, a different option and not continuing to do budget freezes and that we'd be having to look at, you know, are we overstaffed anywhere? And I'm not saying that we are and, and that we are ready to make any of those cuts, but I'd be pushing us to have some different conversations and not continue this pattern of freezing one year's budget to support another and overexpending school choice. Thank That's you. all I have. <laughs> all right. Anyone else? Outstanding, Shelly. No, it's, it's all generally all good news and trending in the right direction. Um, right, I guess that brings us uh, then to the uh, public comment. I think yeah. Keith had his hand up. Oh, sorry, Keith, I don't know, I'm not seeing his image. Go ahead, Keith. Sorry, just a, a question going forward. Do we anticipate that um, the, that the, the state would reinstate um, paying for school lunches or do you think that or do we anticipate that maybe that it's going to be uh, lunches are going to be and breakfast will be basically free from here on out like, is that going to be a revenue producing thing going forward or is it, are we going to have to look at something different going forward do you think i have no idea <laughs> i honestly don't and the food service industry is in crisis right now. And so I don't even know, you know, I know Jeff is concerned about getting his deliveries every week and getting the products that he orders so that we can put out the lunch menus that he's created. And if that problem continues nationwide, I don't think that that's just specific to our district or Massachusetts. I think it's a problem across the country, just like the bus problems that are happening. Um, I don't see how they don't continue to support schools. I mean, it, it, we won't be able to afford to serve lunches if if we have to go completely back the other direction. But they're not talking about any of that yet. At this point, they're, um, from what I'm seeing, state and federal programs are really uh, pushing for, you know, promote your breakfast, bring in that revenue, feed as many students as you can, um, because there are so many families in need right now. But if I hear anything, I'll certainly let you guys know. Right. Well, thank you again. And uh, I guess it's on to uh, public comment if we have any. Hi. Hello. Hi, this is uh, Jill Dickinson. 
Uh, my daughter is in Sunderland Elementary. Um, I guess I just had a question for you guys. You guys would probably be the best people to answer it, um, considering budgets and stuff. Um, so the American Rescue Plan Act and the Elementary and Secondary Emergency Relief Fund gives money to schools, this like COVID funding, right? I guess the ESSER funds and stuff. Um, and I was just wondering if, do you need to follow CDC guidelines to get that funding? Is that something that ties into that? No, that that funding um, comes federally to the state and then the state allocates it based on a calculation um, which has to do with your enrollment, your low income population, your Title I funding. Um, so the amount we get is sort of based on a complicated formula, but it doesn't have any. Okay, to that's what I saw. Yeah, I was needs. trying to look for it today. And I was like, yeah. you know what? I'm just going to ask the school board. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. All right. Uh, anyone else? Am I hearing a hot mic? All right. Well, in that case, uh, thank you, Jill. And uh, on to uh, unfinished business COVID-19 update. Yep, I guess that's that's me there. Um, you know, broke a record not speaking for the first 20 minutes. Um, to be, uh, so basically starting with the COVID update, I threw some just general ideas that I'm talking about in my superintendent's report, so you can reflect on later. But um, we have started pool testing in our buildings. Um, we, we had a pretty good opening COVID-wise, district-wide, COVID-wise, district-wide. Um, and, you know, we were able to start pool testing, I think, um, before many of our neighboring districts, which is, Fortunate and unfortunate, it's unfortunate for our neighbor districts that the state um, promised the testing system to be up and ready to go, and it really wasn't. But on the positive note, Meg Birch um, was ready in August, um, pushing to get the, the testing up and running as fast as possible. So we were able to um, start testing, you know, literally, I think, almost two weeks before some of our neighboring districts. So kind of a balance of a positive for us, but unfortunate across the board, they couldn't get that up and going. I do want to you know, put a thank you note out there to the nursing staff and the volunteer staff that made that happen in those buildings, because basically um, we rolled that out and um, it is another um, you know burden on the nurses and the staffing to get that done, but um, it was um, effective. You know, it did, in the case of Sunderland, it did, it did find a case in the, in the first testing week and we were able to um, you know mitigate spread um, or stop spread. Um, by um, identifying that early. So that was great. Um, any questions on pool testing overall? And go ahead. That's good. Oh. I'm just curious, who does the contact tracing within the school when the pool testing turns up a positive case? Uh, myself, our administrative assistant, Leela, and uh, Sam Fabian, our school nurse. And with the, um, the case we had the first week, um, we identified a few close contacts, both students and staff. And through the testing program with the new test and stay protocols, um, we were able to keep those students in the classroom. They did not have to quarantine, which was different from last year. Um, close con all close contacts last year had to quarantine. And um, you know the mit mitigation strategies worked. And those students uh, came in, they tested first thing in the morning each day and remained in school. So it was uh, very successful. Thanks, Ben. Outstanding. I appreciate the extra there. It really identifies what's going on. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is that I did attend a meeting with the commissioner. Now it's two Fridays ago. We came out to Holyoke, so we actually saw each other in person. Um, and basically, I just kind of wanted to explain to the school committee what, what the future may bring there, according to what uh, Commissioner Riley said. He basically outlined that the, you know, October 1 was his deadline that he created for making a decision about masks again um, as a statewide mandate. Um, he said that he will um, probably, knowing how the decisions will be made, will be made next week late. Um, but he, made, you know, he'll re either recommend either to continue masking um, for another duration of time, or he may come out with, they're working on different different components, such as having vaccination rates in the building reach a certain level, 
Um, testing being at a certain level, I think the numbers were like 80% he was throwing out there. Um, but those aren't, those are, what they're thinking up, those aren't the markers in stone yet. And then having what is the, you know, what is this, you know, the rate within the, either the community or the county. So we're all kind of curious of what that's going to be. No, there's been no early releases of any of that information. Um, I did ask at that meeting, I said, you know, we kind of had a very difficult, um, you know, difficult time in August, and it sounds like we're going to have to have a difficult time within our community, you know, within the masking debate, uh, which way to go within our school systems. And, you know, nobody wanted that kind of tension to start the school year off. Um, and I said, are we going to have that same debate again? Are you going to dump it back on the local districts? And I really, I, I apologize last week in my last school committee meeting, but I was that direct with him, uh, maybe even ruder. Um, and he basically, he had a good answer, though, and I'll give him credit for that. He said, basically, listen, the the school district is local control. So you're going to get recommendations that are going to come out of DESE and then it's going to trickle back to local control. So whether or not it's going to be in October or November or December, at some point, all the policies that we put in place statewide comes back to local control. So, you know, he said, so he said, you know, and it's a good thing for the public to think about. It's very easy to put rules into place. It's a lot harder to take rules away and having people be comfortable with, you know, doing that. And so you can you know, imagine that you know, if we were to remove, start removing rules, we're going to have just as much kind of conflict as we had putting in, if not more so, because you know people are, are taking away safety blankets and that kind of stuff, um, you know, as time goes on. Um, so it's a good point to point out. So you know, basically, if he makes a decision that changes things on October first, we'll see what the wording is on that. Currently, <clears throat> as a reminder, I think you all know this, but the you know the district is under made from the town board of health. And then it's under the direction of the school committee. So the state can change things, but still we have two steps to take care of locally if we are going to change anything the way we're doing business at Sunderland Elementary. So I say that out loud because if you know next week there's an announcement that I doubt he's going to change anything in elementary schools with the vaccine so close on the horizon, but I could I haven't been able to predict anything from the state to a T so far in this pandemic. So you know, I don't want to predict now. Um, but that's kind of just kind of a a summary of you know what we talked about at that meeting. Um, a lot of other stuff was talked about, um, but that was kind of the main thing that was hot on our plates now. Any questions on that or, or thoughts on that that was kind of brought up there at that meeting to kind of see what the future brings? So, you know, the way I think we're looking at it now in our district is we are seeing what the state's direction the state's going to go, and then we're also looking at where the community is. Uh, for those who aren't trying to tracking things, you know, Franklin County has higher rates now than it did last year at this time. And so, um, you know, it is a uh, it is something that we're also watching here and we're going to look at those numbers and make decisions at that time. Um, I will say that, um, you know, in the moment, you know, hearing the different sides of masking and what was going to be best. What people I don't think really realize as well is the amount of changes we made at schools. Um, and we didn't talk about a lot this in August, that it was best that we went back mask. And I don't think we need to doubt that for a minute. Um, we went back and we changed a lot of our protocols. It was not, you know, long, huge spacing that we were at before at six feet or more. You know, we did, you know, where we eliminated some small group work and where we did all these other kind of things. Ben, you could probably jump in and talk about some of the other things that have happened. But we really went back to pre-pandemic teaching method with masks on with some other alterations and safety procedures in place and that kind of stuff. But um, had we done all that without masks, I'm not sure you, know, you have to take steps as a community. Um, and I think it was the right choice. So I wanted to throw that out there too, because we didn't really talk about that in August. It was kind of a very, let's say a difficult meeting with a lot of opinions going around, but I just want to say in hindsight, um, I couldn't see a student without masks to start the school year. Ben, any thoughts on that? That's what you have a spot, but you know, yeah, no, I, I think for, for the kids and everyone else, the, the masks are more, more of an, an annoyance, but the kids would much rather be in school, in person, you know, sitting a couple feet away from their friends rather than being remote and in isolation for months. And the teachers, they would much rather have a full classroom of students in front of them um, in, in engaging with the kids throughout the day. They're, they're really, I, I'd say, aside from the... Um, added tables to the cafeteria. So la last year we were eating in the gym, outside in the cafeteria and in the classroom simultaneously. And so that was a big heavy lift and the big change, really the main change from last year to this year is that students are back in the cafeteria. We do have assigned seats 
the fewer students at each table so that they're spread out a little bit more. Other than that, um, masks are off outside. The kids are r- running around, playing games, and, and having a great time. It's, it has really been pretty positive. And, and the mask issue for the, for the students, they, they are fine. And for students who need a break, they, they receive a break in school. It, it has honestly been a non-issue. That's kind of my COVID summary, I believe. So if anybody has any COVID-related questions, I can take them. Uh, I'll, I'll just throw in two cents, which I, I didn't at that August meeting because there was lots of people talking and it was, uh, uh, like you said, some some big feelings and what have you. Um, yeah, definitely Yeah, looking to the DESE and the local Board of Health for direction. Uh, we really voted on language that was recommended for how do we implement the policy locally. Uh, but I wouldn't want anyone to get the idea that, like, as a school committee, we were very cavalier about telling other people, you need to wear masks. It's, you know, uh, again, we're keeping an eye on, on conditions. We're taking recommendations from people who know a whole lot more about uh, infectious spreads than we do. Uh, but we, we also get that, you know, people don't like to have other people tell them, like, what to do with their kids. Uh, so. Yeah, we're going to keep an eye on it, and uh, when conditions permit, uh, it, like you said, it's it's a big unvaccinated subpopulation within the larger population, uh, which is the elementary school. So uh, we'll relax as soon as we can. All right, and then uh, who's doing the uh, anti-racism equity subcommittee update? So I am. Um, <clears throat> Right now, we have not had our kickoff meeting yet, um, and in, you guys are kind of getting stuff hot off the press where this has gone public, public is that um, we did uh, hire a consultant um, to work with us, and we're going to be part of this kickoff thing, and I received news yesterday that the consultant has backed out from their agreement with us. So we're kind of back to the drawing board. You know, we're, we're trying to get a consultant to work with us and not be a plug-and-play program. There's a lot of great programs out there. Even some of the pro- plug-and-play programs are great. I wanted to get somebody to come in and work with us, you know, where we are at and work, and then obviously then plan for the future. Um, so that person, that group, um, people felt that their plate was overloaded, um, uh, amongst other things, and said that they no longer could do that, which kind of puts us, you know, we spent the month of August trying to go through all that and try to get that lined up. So, we are working now to find other um, individuals who might be open to individuals or groups that might be open to doing that. We're also looking at programs, but again, I'm trying to steer away from programs because we do have our professional development set for the year. We do have committees that have worked to set this year's agenda in this work. So, that's kind of where we're at now. Um, so it's kind of hot off, I'd say hot off the press because we haven't really, I haven't even announced that to the committee yet because um, we we're working today. I was contacting people I know who are working um, in different areas of um, anti-racism and um, equity in schools and asking them who they know. So I'm kind of seeking names and avenues right now. Peter? Um, i just like to add two quick things. Uh, one was that um, over the summer, Jessica and I took part in... Uh, uh, going through the professional development plan for, they had two different plans and we went through one of them uh, with the leadership of uh, a teacher who just retired from Deerfield and a parent who both been involved in anti-racism stuff. And I thought it was fabulous. I learned a whole lot about the history of this country that I was not taught when I was in school and uh, I hadn't picked up really since then. Uh, and it was totally worthwhile. And so I just wanted to, to let the school know that, that uh, you know, we'd asked at some point, should the school committee be doing anything? And I found that going through that myself, and I'm working on the side on the second one of the professional development ones, working my way through that. And it's great. And thank you for, for having that available. Um, the second point is just to, we have a whole lot of staff turnover, as you mentioned. And so we have a good bit of the staff that did not go through that professional development this past year. And um, is there any plan or an expectation of a plan that will sort of catch them up? Knowing that life is very busy and it's hard to find time for things and it's hard to find someone to teach them, but we do have a bunch of people that didn't get that. 
Ben, are you, are you doing anything particular with the new staff on that before I kind of go to the global perspective on that? I think we, we have anti-racism work built into our professional development days. But really, Peter, it's um, it's it's similar to um, every other thing that's happening at happening at Sunderland and the other schools. There is an, an on onboarding process. It's a matter of finding the time to uh, onboard the new faculty with all that we do, whether it's the routines and the procedures, the curriculum, the professional development, and, and not only anti-racism work, but the student choice, um, uh, other forms of PDU that we've done over the past few years. So, I mean, I do want to just kind of add on that. So, our, just because of this consult, we already have a professional development plan put in place for this year. I was looking for, just to make sure that, we, so we've already started that, and we had a early release Friday last week, and so we've already started moving in to that work for this year. Um, I think, Peter, probably a good point. I think I'm going to take a, a double back to see what we can do to get people, to get new, new staff, because we do have quite a bit. As you saw in my superintendent's report, I think we have 33 new teaching staff across the district, across the larger district, which is the largest by twofold. I think the, the average numbers is like low teens. Um, in an average year, we'll have 10 to 12 new, staff, new teaching staff district-wide. Um, <clears throat> I think we'll have to look at that to see how we're doing that. But we have, we do have the plan in place, and we are continuing with our um, anti-racism equity um, professional development and roll out as we work into our curriculums, um, how we're intertwining that work and then we're into the curriculums, which is the plan this year. So don't think that the consultant was was going to help us lead us in that work. It was not to take over. Like We can go without a consultant, but I really wanted to have an outside lens to talk about are we headed the right direction um, as we start to build for next year, you know, we've already started talking, Kim, Sarah, and I are talking about looking at an equity audit, um, which sometimes you do prior, but the way we ran things out last year, we didn't start with an audit. I don't want to start with an audit in the middle of our work. I want to kind of get some of it done and then do an audit to talk about next direction. So, um, you know, doing one of those things as well, looking at next year. But again, that Keith raises his hand. I'm certain. Yeah. Go ahead, Keith. Uh, I'd also like to report that. Um, with the Frontier Regional Committee, I participated in a book discussion we read. So we want to talk about race over the course of the summer. And then last week we participated in a book discussion just amongst the uh, school committee representatives from the four towns ourselves. It was an excellent discussion. Uh, second point, I think, is the consultant um, is really good, but I'm not worried about losing the con consultant. I think there was some good work done last year. And I think you have that broad framework, but then after the consultant comes in, it's time for the teachers to dig into their curriculum and to, to see where they can make improvements. So I think like year two, I'm less worried about the consultant, more worried about like the teachers really working with their 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 specific curriculum. And then just like, I think, just to repeat what you said, Darius, I think that as a district, we're headed in the right direction. Outstanding. Any other comments, questions? All right. Thank you. Uh, on to the uh, summer building maintenance update, including the HVAC. Is that Ben? So I asked Ben to do some of these things as part of his principal's report. So he'll kind of bounce it back into his principal reports to kind of give the updates as he knows the. It's less me talking. Do, do we want to hold off till then? I'm. I'm good either way. I mean, it, we're fine checking it off if you like. Let's check it off. Sure. Um, this uh, summer, we welcomed a new lead custodian to our team, um, Michael Doney. I do want to thank and acknowledge all the hard work that David Grace, our longtime lead custodian, put in uh, for many years at Sunderland. Um, over the summer, uh, Mike, we, we ordered two... Uh, roll off dumpsters and we discarded of um, two two dumpsters of worth of materials um, just clearing out old items that hadn't been used in years we have our back shed garage that ended up a storage area for for many items that um, uh, were damaged and, and no longer in need of having at Sunderland so we filled up two dumpsters um, we had our HVAC company come in uh, Jamrog and perform maintenance, maintenance on all rooftop units. Uh, they provided us with the air exchange reports. And um, in terms of capital projects, the steamer project is still in pro uh, progress right now. 
we're anticipating a mid to late uh, install date in October. Uh, in the spring 2022, we will start our phase two of the rim band. And then also in the principal's report, I provided the committee with some uh, future capital projects, including um, the replacement of the antifreeze and the fire systems. Um, we are starting to work with Advanced Tank to develop a plan for our underground oil tanks. And then we're also in the process of getting updated quotes on the windows and looking at air conditioning in the server room, gymnasium, and library as well. And then lastly, uh, looking for a new boiler to replace the old one. Good deal. Go ahead, Jessica. Uh, I had a constituent ask me to bring two questions about the HVAC system. Um, so the parent of uh, a medically vulnerable child. Um, first question was about the filtration. Do we have MERV 13 or 14 filters? MERV 13, correct, Darius? Yep. yep. Great. And the other was um, about that air exchange report you got. How many times an hour are we exchanging the air in the classrooms? The minimum is two, and it yep. goes up from there depending on the space. Did, did that report have any finer detail then? It has the cubic mass per. I have it, it, it breaks down the cubic feet per minute and the cubic feet per hour um, by room. And so it breaks down the air exchanges per hour um, across, and the minimum is. The minimum is two, and all those increase significantly when you have an open door, open window. Yep. Could I get a copy of that to share with this constituent? Yep. Great, thank you. Keith? You. Keith, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, uh, I was given this information. I don't know if it's true or not, and I think I don't know if it, it provides context to the uh, to alleviate some con concerns of the constituent that Jessica you may have been talking to. Uh, I was told for um, in terms of air exchange for where I teach, I, I was told that the air exchange programs in most of the schools far exceed what air exchange pro uh, air exchange are in most homes. And so that actually the exchange in schools is far better than in most residences. And most of, of the um, COVID contraction is outside of the school. So like it, it's gathering is in, in homes is actually um, much more problematic than in school. So I, I just, uh, can you speak to, is the air exchange in schools actually better than private residences? I'd have to depend on the private residence, as you can imagine, but you have to understand that we're pumping in air and pulling air out of each room. So we're creating an exchange. In your homes, unless you have a central air system that's doing that, you are either heating with, you can either baseboard heating or radiators, or you know, unless you have a force hot air system that is also retracting within the same space, you're not going to get the same turnover. And you're absolutely right. The major amount of transmissions that we saw last year because I was on the front line of hearing about all the different transmissions, was unmasked in a household or at a party in a confined space where there, you know, there was an air exchange. So we've been fortunate to, to date not to have tra school transmission um, or known school transmission. I think is a safer way to say that. Um, and so, yeah, you're, you're right there. And can you, you know, talking with the, you know, you know we use our, um, we use Jamrog as our, as our service company. And he's talking about, you know, you talk about air exchanges, the difference between an open window and open door in a classroom can multiply that to, you know, six, seven, eight air exchanges per hour, depending if there's a breeze outside. Um, so, you know, those kind of things are all factors as well. Number of people in the building, you know, that kind of stuff. Actually, humidity rate changes about how air flows in a classroom and how moisture flows in a classroom. So it gets very scientific. Um, there's a great study at Harvard um, by Joseph, was it Dr. Josephs, who explains all that if someone's really interested in the game. Thank you. All right. Uh, no further questions on that, uh, on to summer programs. 
And again, over the summer, we welcomed close to 50 students for extended learning opportunities. Uh, the summer programs um, had targeted academic instruction, and also the camp uh, featured project-based learning, collaborative problem solving, and learning games as part of the day-to-day -day curriculum. You know, with um, last year being so so trying, I, I do want to acknowledge and thank all of the school staff, not only at Sunderland, but across the district for, you know, giving up four weeks of their summer um, to provide additional instruction for the kids. Um, the summer is, is a really important time for teaching staff to recharge their batteries and, and unwind. But at the but at the same time, it's a critical time for some of our students who might experience more regression compared to others. And just the commitment of the staff, um, you know, at, across the district was very impressive. And uh, we couldn't be more thankful for their for their efforts. Outstanding. Yes. All right. Uh, personnel update. We have welcomed many new faculty members to the Sunderland Elementary School team. Um, uh, cl new classroom teachers in grades two, three, four, and five. We have added our special education team lead position as well. We have two new members of our specialist uh, specials uh, team as well, art and PE. And so overall, it's been a very very smooth transition for our new faculty members. Um, I, you know, I was actually talking with um, a veteran employee the other day and just how fortunate we are um, throughout the interview process to just land exceptional candidate after exceptional candidate. Many of our veteran returning staff members um, served on inter interview committees towards the end of the year and over the summer. Um, and that's, that's not paid. It's, it's just, it's volunteer. So it's just another example of, you know, the, the commitment so many of us have, um, to the students and the well being of our Sunderland elementary school community. Additionally, <clears throat> as part of our onboarding uh, program, we met with all new faculty members prior to the school year starting. And we had, uh, returning faculty members come and be a part of that transition. Um, and just kind of going over the ins and outs of, of how things are happening at Sunderland. Many of the new folks we have brought in have had some form of experience. Um, some are, are veteran teachers as, as well. And although they are new to Sunderland, so we do have a, a, a coaching model going on with, with our uh, veteran new, new hires, if, if you will. And then more of a, a formal mentorship part, uh, program for the ones, the one, those who are just getting started. Outstanding. Boy, we got a lot of issues in this district, uh, but it seems like, like the staff, whether you're talking about the, the town accountants or the, the teaching staff stepping up, custodians, uh, sounds like we're at least in a good position with respect to people. We absolutely are. All right, uh, we've got an MOU with DESI and DCF. That's up for discussion. That sounds like you, Darius. No, but Shelly. Oh, it's Shelly. <laughs> no, that's fine. You don't know that. You wouldn't know this, Greg. I just I spread things out this meeting, so we're more fun. He's delegating. Okay, so uh, this should have been included in your packet. There is a memorandum, memorandum of understanding with uh, DESI, DCF, and Executive Office of Health and Human Services in relation to the Every Student Succeeds Act and transportation for children who are in foster care. Uh, so we are looking for um, a vote. I, it didn't say vote on the agenda, but I think that's what we've done in the other school committees. Um, a vote in support of this Memo MOU being signed by the select board because technically the MOU will be between the town and those three agencies, not school committee and those three agencies. Um, basically, the MOU says, you know, all of these definitions and things that are in here and defining um, the different agencies and how someone is considered to be in foster care that we will 
report properly, file the report by the deadline, and um, exclude certain other things. Like you can't include transportation that's in someone's IEP. Um, even if they are in foster care and they have an IEP, you can't submit for transportation reimbursement that way. Um, you know, anyone who's considered a homeless student, that's reported another way. Um, in Sunderland, this actually does come up in some of our other schools. It's, you know, really not something that happens frequently, maybe every few years. Um, but in Sunderland, in the three years that I've been with the school, I think it's come up every year. Um, last year, the expense to the district was $13,000 for transportation of, a, of students in foster care. And if the state funds the reimbursement at 70 or 75%, it's great to help us. Um, we do not build in a line item for this um, because it's an, one of those unknowns. So typically, uh, we hope that there's savings from another budget account or we have to dip into another funding source. Um, one of the other school committees at, an, at another meeting had said that she didn't think that this was currently being funded by the state. I'm hearing mixed reports about that, but I also don't think it harms us to have this in place to file the report. And if they do fund the reimbursement, we could be eligible for some funds. So um, we're looking to bring this to select board to get this signed so that we can move ahead with this process. Peter? Yeah, I read through this pretty carefully and and it seems to make total sense to me. And so uh, just to get things moving here, I would move that the school committee vote in favor of the memorandum of understanding and forward it to the select board with a recommendation that they approve it. I'll second. Uh, any other discussion? Keith, go ahead. Uh, just FYI, this has already been approved at Frontier, I believe, Darius, correct? Okay. At Frontier, the, the school committee at Frontier actually has the has the power to approve it. And when we met with the town administrator, Shelly and I, we meet occasionally with them. They said, you know what, if the, we brought it to them and said, you know, can you get this done? And they said, you know, it'd make most sense that the board that's in charge of education recommends the school committee since you have the knowledge base, you're coming from the knowledge base for them to sign that document. So that's why it's going this loop because um, it went through that meeting. Any further discussion? All right, uh, Megan. Yes. Uh, Peter. Yes. Keith. Yes. Jessica. Yes. Greg. Yes. All right. We got the vote. And zoom back up. Um, future school committee. So right now we're meeting remotely, and. Uh, Darius, uh, we've already seen you uh, jumping back and forth between two computers, and you've got another meeting backed up right after this one. Uh, and I know that we, we have uh, mass policies uh, in the school. I just wanted to have a, a little discussion. We could have held this uh, email, but uh, get people's thoughts and impressions on uh, how hard do we want to push to meet the person? Are people available for that? And what legal obligations do we have to to allow people to uh, participate remotely if they choose not to come in in person, if we have an in-person meeting. So I'll just give you the legal side that you, what you have to do, responsibilities you have, and then you guys can you know, talk that part out. So legally right now, you do have to have a virtual component to your meeting. So you have to televise it, um, you have to live stream it rather, and you have to have the ability for the public to participate remotely. Um, and that is in place until um, that was put out until I believe it's until April 2nd of 22. So no matter what we do, I have to have a setup where I have to have two computers going. One's the, one's the stream and one's, well, technically I have to have one. I have to stream it depending on how you camera the other, the other kind of component. Um, actually, I need to have two because I need to be able to run the remote people, that kind of stuff. There are solutions to all these problems. I kind of wrote that in an email to all of you. Like we can, um, or maybe I just sent it to Greg, right? should we send that to you? Did I send it to the Initially, I think it was just to me. And, and um, There are solutions. I can hire people to run the, the, the technology side of it. Right now I run two things. I run back and forth and I do that. Um, if someone misbehaves online, I have the ability now to shut it down where we didn't have that um, a year ago. Um, those kind of things. Um, we also, have, I have said back-to-back -back meetings as part of one of those things I asked the school committees to consider, being a family 
for those who don't understand that, I have kids, I want to go to their games and be a part of their lives outside of it, not doing five meetings a month outside of the other meetings. You know, people don't realize that I have other subcommittees and those kind of meetings that I have to attend as well. So some of those, those really add up. So when we stack meetings, it, especially when it's um, routine business, which I would call this month's stuff. Um, in budget season, we don't stack the meetings. So, you know, that was something we don't have to stack meetings or we can stack them further apart that allows travel time and that kind of thing. Um, and then if it's a mask mandate, we're in the same room, we're going to have to identify, can we stay far enough apart without a mask when there's a mask mandate in the town of Sunderland? Um, and, you know, and how does it get filmed? You know what I mean? So if you get to, you're going to have to have each person talking, but you also have to be able to see somebody on the screen. So you can see there's a lot of technology issues. It's certainly doable, except the Frontier District and four schools doesn't have that set up right now. Um, one of the options I said is we could create a one center place that has the ability, the full technology set up where the school committee could go to. That's a larger setup. Um, the other problem is that if you have, you know, you don't know what you're going to get for public comment. Um, remember we had over 250 on the last call, um, probably around 200 after you re remove some of, you know, all the people that had to be there, so to speak, all the board members and such. So if you all of a sudden had 30 people in a confined space, you know, that kind of stuff. So you have to keep that in mind too. You know, this evening, we probably could have pulled it off in the library with a cameraman and all this kind of stuff. So those were issues. So I said, you know, at this first meeting, I really pushed that we do it this way so that we had some, and we know how to do this. People do know how to participate. People are trained now kind of on this in the beginning. We didn't think this was going to work and it did. So, um, next meeting is a joint meeting. Um, so again, it's going to be too large unless we want to have it outside or, you know, that kind of, we're in an auditorium, which has its own challenges when we know this does work. Cause it is about, I guess, give you my opinion. It is about, you know, can we communicate effectively and can the public communicate if they need to effectively and can we broadcast effectively? I think we've, we've, chat, we've, we've met that challenge. That's for sure. So, you know, when I say when you're bringing back, I ask why are you bringing back to some level as well, um, you know, that kind of thing. So, anyway, those are the rules as I see, or the problems as I see it, and you can ask questions or whatever or talk about yourself. Peter? You, I'm, I'm in no rush to, to change from what we are doing now because there's still enough uncertainty and um, just that the, the, the health requirements in terms of, of meeting in person that, uh, you know, I will say the select board is now back to meeting in person, but then there are only four people involved in a meeting, the three, three members of the board and the, and the uh, town administrator. Um, and they are also, uh, you can also get on via your compu computer and you can communicate with them, you know, the same way we're doing right here. So they have, done, I guess, the alternative setup to what we're doing here, meaning you have to have the the, the ability to communicate remotely. Um, and they have an FCAT member and a whole facility right there in that room um, so that uh, it, it makes it easier for them to, to launch it. Uh, it's still going to be, there's still going to be issues when they have a public hearing and they get a good number of people there and all crowded into a fairly small space. So that's still to be dealt with and um, so on. But for the time being, I'm, I'm happy just continuing like we are, but expecting, you know, obviously we got to be going back to in-person at some point here. Keith? Yes, just so to, for full disclosure, I emailed uh, Greg and Darius earlier asking why we couldn't meet in person. And just for the sake of simplicity, for the thousands of people in general public who are going to be watching this, uh, the school, because it, the common thing is that the teachers and students are meeting, but we're not. So, uh, as was fully explained to me, and it's very clear, uh, teachers and students fall under DESI, and there is no remote option, whereas we fall under mass general law, and we have to provide a remote option. So, that's the essential difference right there. And then, so if we're going to provide a remote option, it's going to be basically an outlay of funds. Either we hire a technology person or we have to get more technology. So it's going to cost us more. So I would like to go back to in-person as soon as we can, but with the idea that it's going to be an outlay of funds, it's going to be more, more hiring. It's going to be difficult. I would, you know, eventually I'd like to go back, but um, I just want everybody to understand why we're, we're meeting as we are now. It's, it, it's completely understandable. Jessica. I'll, I'll just 
piggyback on that reasoning that um, I think we know at this point that remote format can be a real hindrance to teaching and learning in a way that this remote format has not, from my perspective, negatively impacted our ability to govern. I know that there have been other local boards that have felt like um, remote didn't work very well for them, but I have felt like this is very effective. I can see and hear everybody clearly. The public can see and hear us clearly. Um, so I, I'm, this is working and I'm in no rush to change it. Yeah, so uh, I definitely also have some complicated feelings here. Uh, on the one hand, you know, you never know if someone's on a meet, whether they're wearing their, their, their uh, bunny slippers on and a pina colada right outside the frame, right? And there, there's a certain dignity that when you go to the building and you're all there together. Uh, but then I, I'm like, well, Greg, are you, you're just not being millennial enough or maybe you're, you're a stick in the mud and uh, not, you know, there's this whole question of like, what is what does this whole revolution mean for remote work? Uh, I definitely agree with Jessica that this is a, uh, a pretty effective tool. Even before COVID hit, I was asking for the ability to do the screen share stuff. I like just in terms of communicating with the public and with each other, I like having everyone with the screen up instead of lots of people rifling through individual stacks of paper. Uh, and, and even if we go back to the meetings, I'd almost tell the, uh, FCAT people say this out loud. Uh, keep your video camera. We'll set up a laptop in one corner that can film everybody, but then we can still, uh, you know, I'd love to be able to screen share, like seeing the, the Shelly stuff and be able to go through line, line by line. Uh, that feels really valuable to me. I know we tried once in the library to do that kind of thing, but uh, that's kind of where I'm at. Right now, it feels like the health issue is, is, uh, and some pragmatic issues is making this the most effective option. But uh, as we go back to in-person meeting, I don't want to lose track of, of some of what this technology has brought us. All right. Any other thoughts on that? Or? Yeah, I think we can set the goal. You know, um, as you guys may remember, we have a, we'll have a November meeting. Um, we did not have put a December one on for a regular session if we need to have another reason to have a meeting in December. And then we start budget in January. And maybe our goal is to be together for January. I mean, it's, it's pointing. I mean, we set goals and we have to come back to it. Yeah. Again. And we don't just get, you know, um, and we can talk about, you know, I'm sure there are solutions. You know, with every problem, I want to make sure that we always have solutions. You know, I can get laptops for the loan out to each one of you when you walk into the building. We can sit in the far corners of a room. You know, you know, is it going to be better as we talk over a screen to Jessica, the other side of the room, instead of, are we just going to sit in the same room this way and we're all going to look at our computers? You know, so I don't know. I, I'm trying to imagine it. And it's kind of foggy, but I think we can revisit that. Maybe we say, you know, let's, let's have this discussion for the January meeting, which is an independent meeting. There's no, it's not a staff meeting. It's the beginning of budget season um, that we discuss whether or not we have it and we what do you think about that, Greg? It makes us come back. Yeah, down. and you know, and just to throw again, definitely punt till then. We'll we'll play the health stuff by ear, but uh, I don't know. Let's throw it out there. I wouldn't be opposed to going to Frontier if there was one setup. You know, make life easy for Darius. We all just show up there, and it's one tech setup. And the reason I said this, I talked to my tech crew about like how can we do this, and oh, we can get the smart board up, and that can project the person who is speaking onto the screen. Everybody can see that for sound and whatever, and we can do this. And I go, well, we can't do that. Oh, well, we can't yet. I mean, some of this stuff is being ordered, and you know that kind of stuff. So um, I was like, well, maybe we start in one place where I know it's going to work. Because we did try this last December for Deerfield, and it was a disaster. I was crawling around trying to plug things in and blah blah blah. You know, I even said something wrong because I was frustrated with something. Um, so it was one of those kind of like fully frustrating meeting. I'm more worried about this than the, than the content of the meeting, trying to make sure the camera went to everybody. It was a mess. Nobody could hear anything. So I have that PTSD of that, let alone everything else. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Uh, in that case, on to the uh, BEDH public comment uh, update. So basically, um, within the public comment, the we we changed our public comment um, to try to you know after we were we went to 
Zoom meetings and we get we're online meetings. We kind of got that we got a Zoom bombed. So we put in another layer of protection to invite people to this meeting and then also project it live on YouTube. Um, and in that we said, oh well, you know, we we encouraged you know the public always could write in to the school committee. We also encouraged people to write in then we'd read it. Like we, it was it was best intentions. Well when I when we got to the very heavy meeting of the masking and we had a lot of public write-in, which was great to get that feedback. And then we were going to read them aloud because we said we were going to do that. I ran by the attorney and he was like, you should not be reading another person's opinion out loud at a meeting um, for multiple reasons. One, you're in a technology age where whoever's reading it could be lifted and then it could be assumed that if I read something and I said something that was, you know, you know, uh, disparaging to students or something of that sort. Someone could say, look what the superintendent said. You know, and I know you can clean it up. I see a lot of bad postings out there. That's one reason. The other one is, what if there's something in there that you don't agree with, the reader doesn't agree with, or feels like it may be in violation, isn't sure, and then edits that. I don't feel like I'm going to... Now, all of a sudden, you're censoring someone's opinion, and then they're not fully fully represented. The other one is that you. this is a business meeting, and um, you can write into the school committee at any time they read your remarks and we can even let people know that we got their remarks. And you, I know all of you do right back. Thank you for your thoughts. And when they send you emails and that kind of stuff, and there's no need for us to be reading stuff again into, into public comment and, and creating, um, you know, uh, of that opinion has to be out there when we've all read that thing, when we have a set time to do business. So those are the kind of the reasons why you really shouldn't be, some of them are stronger than others, but those are the reasons why you shouldn't be reading. And so he said, you really, our last policy never said that we were going to be, we changed it, but prior to the changing of the, the video thing, we never said we would read them. Um, it said that things longer than three minutes can be written and submitted as public record, but it never said we would be reading those public submissions. So, um, you know, I'm proposing, this is coming from council, that we're proposing the change that we no longer read public comment. People can sign up. They can read their own materials into public comment. And unless the chair feels that uh, something, you know, the chair can make an exception. There's a reason why someone can't read their thing, you know, that kind of thing. Um, whatever, if there happens to be a need for an exception, the power of the chair is in there, um, as it always is. So that's that's basically what this this is this uh, document is saying. Um, the other committees had also said, you know, we had some. Um, you know, we had some remarks that were um, that were offensive to to people, many people in our community, and specific groups in our community. Um, and we also there was talk about like how can we improve public comment um, to protect all citizens during during public comment. And um, you know, if someone is to go um, go against our policy, and what do we need to do as school committee members? And so, what was suggested? And sorry, if I'm, I, I know sometimes like I give another suggestion from another committee, but it moves things along. Um, they said that we really should have rules be read prior to the start of any public comment. So to remind people that, you know, if you're going to make remarks that go against this, that you're going to be asked to stop or you're going to be removed from the meeting, that kind of stuff, that you're sticking within the parameters, that you're talking about stuff that's under the control of the school committee or on the agenda, you know, those kind of things. And you shouldn't be calling out staff members by name and you know, those kind of things. And so I'm putting that together already because that was requested of me. Um, and then the final thing is talking about what school committee members should do if they feel there's been a breach of our policy. And we don't ever really talk about that. People join the committee and we never really say if all of a sudden Ben's from the public and he goes off and starts, you know, saying bad things about the superintendent um, that are personal in nature, not professional in nature, and Greg is like, uh, not really paying attention. What does the rest of the school committee do? And um, I added to the language that school committee members should be calling for a point of order. And they're addressing the concern, not at Ben, but to the chair. And they said, you know, uh, Mr. Chair, they, I believe there would be these comments do not fall within the policy. And I ask that we that you make a correction at this time. So, because we have these really heavy meetings, it's very difficult. If we don't have tons and tons of training to be leaders of to run meetings and that kind of stuff. And we have some people that have been done it, doing it for years, but you get 250 people on, it's a lot to ask of people. 
and we need to work and support one another um, through stre very stressful times of being in a school community. So I ask, I say that out loud as well, because it is something that it feels it feels like it was months ago. It was probably just a month ago, but um, it's still kind of fresh in many of our minds. What you know, what occurred at the last meeting. So that's what I have. Kind of two points there, but the first one being no longer reading at school at the committee uh, meetings. Um, Keith, move to accept revised policy BD, BEDH. Megan, I see your head nodding. Is that a second? I second, yes. Outstanding. All right, Peter, do you have something? Yeah, I think we got to waive some uh, reading uh, obligations that we normally have on changing policy. Um, Isn't that for a new policy if we're updating an old one? I'm not sure we need the three readings. Actually, we did waive it in all the other committee meetings, so Peter is correct. Um, just to keep, of course, I can find out, Jessica, if we're modifying the existing policy, if it needs a double, but I believe we should recognize that we do have a double reading policy. There's no harm in it. So, so maybe I can consolidate that with Keith's motion and make a motion that waives the uh, required first and second reading. Uh, of the uh, revised policy and uh, then votes to approve it. Outstanding. As presented. Keith, nodding head, that's a second? That's a second. That's a second. All right. Uh, any further discussion? I do have a few sure. questions. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and, and this is sort of about the mechanics of how we're doing this right now. Who checks the public comment email account? Is it Darius or Donna? So comments come in to Donna Hathaway. The reason why there's a three o'clock deadline is that she's here till four. So, you know, she checks it right up to almost four o'clock. But, you know, there's a deadline at three so that someone's here to check it. Because I'm in back to back meetings, there's no one available at that point moving forward. So she checks it, she forwards any public comment on to, I believe, all of you. And then in the case where we had a massive amount, she started doing a running list to make sure that we were tracking because it started to get, as you know, very quickly, very confusing. Because then we started, we received a lot of comments that didn't want to be read as well, or didn't indicate we read. So then we emailed everybody out that said, you didn't indicate whether or not you wanted to be read or not, but we've opened it up to all other people you read. We want to make sure you have that option as well. And then some people wrote, I want to read my own. And then some people said, I don't want to read it. I just want to use for information. So then she went through and organized that as well. So it was kind of a big, a lot of organization behind the screen, behind the scenes. Or screening. I'm just sort of wondering if any of that should be codified into the policy, if we should have email address written into this policy and sort of the affirmation that if you send a written comment, it will be forwarded to the school committee members. Some of it goes straight to us, right? I mean, not the, not the email address that's on the agenda. Fair. Correct. I mean, our, our email addresses are all on the school website, so mm -hmm. they are accessible to the public. Um, but they don't get put onto the agenda that people would see if they were like looking at the calendar. So you're saying, just so I understand, uh, we let people know that if they send in public comment to that email, it becomes part of the permanent record. Is that, is that what I'm That it will get shared with us. If they sent a written okay. comment but do not want to speak it themselves in a meeting, I just want to make sure written comments aren't disappearing into that email address without reaching us in one form or another. It sounds like that is the practice Donna is forwarding them. Um, I'm just wondering if that needs to be explicit to the public. So and it could be in the agenda way, instead of the policy. That's where I'm thinking, I was thinking too, because okay. nobody sees policies. You know, we the, the, it's the rule book you pull out when there's a violation, but until then, nobody's gonna go, you know. Um, I mean, people's on all our websites have the school committee and all your emails. So if somebody wanted to contact any of you, they would go to the website, they find school committee and all your emails are there. And then we have one for public comment at the meetings. You know, it, they do get forward, that's Donna's job, um, to make sure that happens. And so, I don't know. I'd be fine with adding that to the public comment statement that goes on the agenda. I just think some transparency about the process is worth having. I, I like it on the agenda. 
Great. Thanks. I do look up our policies <laughs> every month okay. or two, but maybe I'm That's not the one. Someone needs, I'm sorry, there's a buffer going back and forth outside my door, but the, um, somebody explain what I need to add to the next posting and I'll do it. That's certainly all within, actually within the chair. Uh, can I send you an email? Keith. <laughs> I'm rereading the policy. So the last thing says written comments submitted to the school committee. So I think there's the assumption that all comments provided make it to the school committee. I think what Jessica may be asking is that we have to ensure that comments sent to that email make it to the like, make it to the school committee members. I think it's it is written in there that the, the assumption is it kind of gets to us, but I think that we just want to make sure that we're completely transparent that it does make it to us. Yes, you don't even need to vote on that. Okay. Any further discussion? All right. Peter? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Megan? Yes. Keith? Yes. Greg? Yes. Outstanding. All right, and uh, the MASC Mass Joint Conference. Oof. We we had some conversation about this right at the beginning about uh, they sent out all the resolutions, and that's uh, maybe more than we can uh, uh, chew uh, through on this meeting. Is anyone going to the conference? Jessica, yeah. This is going. Peter, are you going? No, but I wanted to move that we appoint Jessica Corwin as our delegate to the MASC MASS meeting. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All right. Jessica? Sure. Yes. Peter? Yes. Megan? Yes. Keith? Yes. And then Greg? Yes. All right. We'll shoot for next year when that uh, all the resolutions come out. We'll see if we can get in front of that. I get the sense that some school committees kind of have a, a meeting to go through that and talk it through before they send the representative. So some of the people were talking would talk about like what had been said in the individual school committees uh, before they were sent as a representative. So. And what have we got for, uh, I certainly don't have any reports. Any committees met the last month? No. Nope. All right. Uh, collaborative, no. All right. Principal, Ben, did we, is there anything left that we didn't touch on when you're talking about the... Yeah, just, um, the... Am I unmuted here? Sorry, I'm just scrolling on another screen. Um, the... Town Administrator uh, Jeff Kravitz and I recently completed the ADA Playground Grant application. That will be submitted shortly. We are applying for two separate grants. The first to cover the, um, the safety, su safety surface portion of the project, which is the asphalt walkway and port in place rubber surface. That is for $52,000. And then the main play structure portions of the of the project, which comes in at sixty five thousand dollars, we would we will find out um, in mid mid December, I believe, as to whether or not we are awarded that grant. So that's a uh, a sign of potential good things to come. Um, once again, with the the two hundred thousand dollars that the town voted to go towards the uh, playground this past June. We are we are getting very, very close to making this uh, playground become a reality. So it's 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 really exciting. And also with um, some other f uh, funding that we've secured, we have been able to use it on various components of the playground. Um, and so little by little, we are we are purchasing different uh, elements that will be 
be ready to uh, be installed come build time. Outstanding. All right. Uh, Darius, you have any other uh, superintendent report stuff? Um, the only other highlight, I mean, you can kind of read through it, is that uh, we didn't talk about transportation. You know, uh, group of transportation is missing. Did have some drivers leave them right before the school year started, so they are short. I did send Shelly to my other meeting too, so that she can open up so we can get in. Um, and so they are working at it. Doesn't affect Sunderland, affects Deerfield right now. Um, they were able to combine routes, but they are looking for drivers. And contractually, they, um, you know, because they're missing bus runs, they're they're financially motivated to get those buses up and running because we're saving money. Um, that's not how we want to save money, but that's we're saving money on the fact that those runs aren't running. So just FYI, on a, on a grander scheme, it's not affecting someone directly, but you may hear stuff about that. That's all I have, I think. <clears throat> Go ahead, Peter. I said one thing I wanted to just toss out for future consideration, and that is that I guess I'm addressing this mainly to Darius, and that is that I really don't like the big joint meetings. Um, I find that, uh, you know, maybe it's my own sense that I feel intimidated into like, you know, if you, the moment you start speaking, you're wasting so many other people's time, whatever. It just seems way too many people to be in a meeting to, to, to have any sort of sense that we're really getting stuff done here. Um, I realize there are special circumstances, but what I was actually getting at here was that to the extent, I can't think back of our normal, when I think back to the normal uh, April and October joint sessions that we regularly have scheduled that I've been to, to me, the most important one that we had when we really needed to be together was stuff dealing with uh, hiring of a superintendent, hiring of a business manager, those sorts of things, all being in the same room, that was very valuable. But a lot of other stuff, if it's presented to us in a joint meeting, like a presentation from the uh, Sarah or uh, uh, Kim about, you know, how MCAS scores are doing something like that. Any discussion that you might want to get about things specific to your town are harder to do because, again, you've got a whole crowd there in the meeting. And so I would just hope that it could be thought about ways in which we could, you know, only do the joint stuff for the stuff that's really necessary. And otherwise, I just find it like, Man, it's it, it just I, it, I really don't like it. And I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one, but you know, and I, whatever. I just wanted to say that. Outstanding. All right, thank you, um, Darius. We got to get you off to your next meeting. Uh, yes, no, I heard you, Peter. I, you know, I, 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 I you know, I, next month the year still haven't done my evaluation, so that's kind of the reason why there's no one joint meeting. We were going to look at MCAS scores as well, um, you know, because it's a district wide looking at how we are moving as a district wide. And we also have to talk about uh, negotiations and probably be an executive session to talk about our goals for negotiations because that's going to start up relatively very quickly. Just to add on what Peter was saying, I actually don't mind the joint meetings, but what my, my difficulty comes in the breakout of trying to do the, the individual Sunderland meeting after the joint meeting because I feel like I'm running back and forth between Frontier and then getting into the Sunderland late, and it just doesn't work for me. So I don't mind the, the large joint meeting itself. I just don't, I struggle with trying to add on the, the individual small meetings. I think that if we do those large meetings, it should be just like, like you're saying, those large district-wide um, idea situations and, and I, I don't know if we need, really need to like try to break out and do the individual small school committee meetings but just to to add to what Peter was saying I, I'm not planning on doing the small breakouts afterwards it's too while we could technologically do it because Google Meet now has breakout groups you could do it all but the public couldn't follow it and, and if even if we could try to map it out for them then the average person who doesn't use Google Meet would not be able to and that would be unfair to the public on that so um I think it's kind of a check in there based on, I don't know what masking is going to do. We may have other meetings next month. You know, um, this is just a regularly scheduled meeting. Um, and again, I mean, October is, it's pretty rote stuff usually, you know? And so um, that's one of the reasons why we picked that month to combine. Um, and then also dragging professionals out, you know, to five separate meetings um, like Sarah and um, used to be Sarah Louise, Sarah Kim, the Sarah Kim show I used to call it um, to give them to give the kind of overview about how things are going. 
Um, but you're right. I mean, we don't talk about individual MCAS scores, but then again, we don't try not to focus them as a whole. We try to do that as, so I hear you. I hear what you're saying though, because I kind of, I mean, I think, you know, I, I'm sort of assuming I'm just going to have to suck it up and deal with it, but I just thought I'd express my, mainly I like these meetings so much and I find that they are a really good of exchange of ideas. And I find that the committee that we have, we've got, we've got what seems to me is five people that each bring special skills and special and their own experiences and their own life situations. And all this gets played out in a way where we have enough time, but we don't waste it. Okay. And feeling like, yeah, we are getting stuff done. You know, that's, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And the, big joint meetings, I have a much harder time coming away with that sense of positive and optimism. So, but I love these little, I love our own school committee meetings. We got, I think we got a great group and. Outstanding. Yep. All right. You want Andreas, to yeah. Goodbye. To, we have to close, but uh, we can say goodbye to you first. Uh, I was, just, I was just going to make a motion to adjourn. If, uh, Sounds good. Uh, second? Keith, all right. Uh, let's see. I assume no discussion. Jessica? Yes. Megan? Yes. Keith? Yes. Peter? Yes. Greg, yes.